If you want to join me in welcoming up our guest speaker, Jordan Abbott, who's going to be bringing words today, let's give him a big round of applause. Thanks, Josh. Hey, everybody. Um, maybe slight correction. I'm, I'm not actually technically not a guest anymore. I'm around for the long haul, actually. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, my name is Jordan. Uh, I actually, yeah, just came on staff recently. I capped some part time as uh, in the role of church planting apprentice. And when, you know, Ben said, uh, I think in the future I'm going to do like pastor stuff. <laughs> I kind of feel in a similar place. I'm going to do like church planting stuff. I don't know exactly what, but I know that that's where God is leading me. Um, so I also work part time as a structural engineer. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I feel like it's, this is my first time kind of speaking as, as, a, as a member on staff at Capstone. So I'm super excited. Uh, glad to be here. And I got a question for you guys this morning. Um, and the question is this, how do you welcome a king? Um, that's kind of a weird question for people who live in Canada. And, and, uh, and, you know, I think we have this idea of kings and queens that kind of doesn't really connect with our culture. Um, but I'll ask this question, and you can, be, you can be honest and be vulnerable, and you don't have to be embarrassed. But, but raise your hand if you're one of those people who's actually super interested in, like, the royal family in England. Anybody? Okay, yeah, yeah. So people are buying those magazines in Superstore that are on like the front row. Uh, uh, you know, I see, I see that stuff and I always feel like, man, this is, this is so weird to me. Like it doesn't make any sense to me. This person who's like sort of a figurehead and they're, um, they live this like crazy life that like nobody else has. Um, and I just don't really connect with or resonate with that. But it's interesting. I've been, I was looking where Sarah and I were watching this documentary on, on Netflix uh, about the life of Lady Diana. Has anyone seen that? It's sort of like it's, there's one that's kind of like her life and what it was sort of like on the surface, and there's another one that's what like she deeply experienced, and it was like she had depression, she struggled with, like very, like around the time of her, her marriage when she became a princess, she struggled with an eating disorder, and she didn't know who she was, and, and so there's this crazy stuff, um, but there's all this pomp and circumstance and like grandeur that surrounds uh, kings and queens, and it's interesting this morning, so we're going to be looking at a passage, we're continuing in this, in this uh, series through the Gospel of John, um, and it's a story that's called often the triumphal entry, where Jesus is coming into Jerusalem, and he's being welcomed like a king. And uh, in Canada, like, we don't really have uh, a perception of what that's like. We don't really have, like, our, our political figures don't, we don't really revere them in that way. <laughs> Uh, we, we do different things. I don't, some of you remember this. This is maybe, maybe before some of your time, but we, had a, a, we used to have a prime minister, Jean Chrétien. Do you guys remember Jean Chrétien? Somebody actually hit him in the face with a pie one time. Like that, that kind of stuff happens in Canada. If you did that to the queen of England, like you'd probably be, I don't know, like life in jail, you'd get shot. I don't know. Like. <laughs> but the guy got 30 days in jail and then they let him out. Like that was it. So anyways, um, but these political figures, um, they generate a variety of responses. In it. So how do you welcome a king? Um, it's amazing that we've landed on this text the day before we have a political election, a federal election in Canada. And I think it's something that God providentially arranged. I, I texted Kyle, I was like, did you pick this like, passage for today knowing there's an election tomorrow? And I think he wanted to say, yes, I did. I'm such a good planner, but he didn't. <laughs> um, but we did. So we're in the, uh, this, this story of the triumphal entry of Jesus, a super important story. All four of the gospels accounts tell this story. Um, it's really important. And so we're going to look at it today. But before we do, I want to pray for us. Uh, and I want us to pray actually for the election tomorrow. Um, I think it's really important. I know, I know a lot of you are, are a little bit younger than me. Um, you know, Stats Canada tells us that people 35 and under, about half of them will vote in a federal election. And if it doesn't seem like an important election, it'll be even less. And I just want to say this. I, I could say it's your, you know, it's your civic duty to vote. Um, but the Bible actually talks about how God establishes governing authorities. And so if you want to be a part of what God is doing in Canada, you should vote. It's a good idea. But let's pray. So I'm going to pray for us this morning. We say this all the time at Capstone. Prayer is just talking to God uh, and listening for his voice. Uh, and we're going to be doing that all morning this morning. So let's pray. I'll, we'll pray for our service and we'll pray for the election tomorrow. So Father, this morning we're going to look at what it means to see your son Jesus as a king. Uh, and a lot of us don't really know what it's like to have a king. <laughs> but Jesus, you were a king unlike any other. You're not the one that we, uh, people were expecting. And so I pray you'd help us this morning just to see you as you actually are. 
Um, because when we see you as you are, um, I know I've experienced in my life, we just fall more and more in love with you. You're the kind of king that we want to bow down to, the kind of king that we want to serve. So I pray you'd help us to see, us, see that this morning. And Father, we pray uh, just a simple prayer for the, for the election tomorrow. Jesus, you taught your disciples to pray um, this prayer, that your kingdom would come and that your will would be done. So Jesus, I pray that, uh, that as people go to vote and if, as we've been voting already, that your kingdom would come and that your will would be done. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So if you've got a Bible, you can turn uh, to John chapter 12. Um, I'll just set, up, set the story up briefly before we get there, but John chapter 12, verse 12. Uh, if, if you want, you can grab one of the black Bibles on the table in front of you. If, if you don't have a Bible, just take that one and, and take it home with you and, and, and start reading through it. Uh, we would love for you to just have that as a gift. That'd be uh, from us to you. Um, but this story is often called, the, the, the title you'll see probably says the triumphal entry. And so it was this um, interesting event. And, and just to set up the story a little bit, um, it was happening about a week before a, a Jewish festival called the Passover. And the Passover was this event, um, sort of like a festival that, they would, that the Jews would have, where everybody who was a Jew would all come to Jerusalem. The population of Jerusalem would increase like five times. Um, and everybody was coming to celebrate this, this thing called the Passover. And the Passover was this event where they would remember um, that there was a time in their history where they were all enslaved in Egypt. And God had sent a person, Moses, to come and deliver them out of slavery and into a promised land where there would be freedom and liberty and prosperity and blessing. And so the, the, the purpose of this event was to remember that God had done that for them. And so Jesus is, um, has been, been walking around, like around the area, talking about the kingdom of God. Uh, he's been in Jerusalem uh, doing these miracles and teaching about who God is. Uh, and there's this other religious group called the Pharisees. They're like the political elite, the sort of kind of governed the Jews. Um, and they really don't like Jesus. They're actually like, they're, they're opposing him. And they're actually at this point in the story, they want to kill him because they don't like all the trouble that he's causing. And so Jesus and his, and his disciples, they know that to go to Jerusalem is risky. Um, and other accounts of the gospel actually, actually says in this same story that, um, that they were afraid. And Jesus says, no, we're going to go to Jerusalem. This is my father's will. And so Jesus is making his approach to Jerusalem as the capital city. So let's pick it up in verse 12. It says, the next day, uh, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him crying, Hosanna. That's a Hebrew word. It means like save us or, or save now. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written. Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, they remembered these things that had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they'd heard he had done this sign. So the, prophet, so the Pharisees said to one another, you see, you are gaining nothing. Look, the whole world has gone after him. Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So, those, so these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and they asked him, sir, we wish to see Jesus. And Philip went and told Andrew, and then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus, and Jesus answered them. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life will lose it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there my servants will be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. This is God's word for us this morning. So what we're seeing in this passage is, is sort of like a spontaneous political rally. Um, there's all these people that are coming together, and the, and the Jews believed, um, and this was like deeply steeped in the study of the Passover, that, the, that God was going to send this person they called the Messiah. And the Messiah was like a political kingly figure uh, that God was going to send to usher in this new era for, for his people of, uh, of freedom from oppression, of liberty, of blessing, uh, and that they would receive everything, that, all the blessings that God wanted to give them. And so um, this morning, we're going to look at this, this idea that there's this, this spontaneous, explosive um, political rally, and at the center of it is Jesus, 
And these people want to make him king, but there's this interesting thing that these same people, if you continue to read the story, who want to make him king only six days later, and the same crowd are shouting, crucify him, kill him. So either Jesus completely failed in what it was that he was trying to do, or he is a king unlike anyone thought he would ever be. So this morning, I'm just going to look at three things uh, in this text that, that, to me, God just sort of highlighted to share this morning about why we can know for sure that Jesus is this Messiah. He's this person that God had sent, this kingly figure um, to, to usher in a new era for God's people. And three things are this. There's the significance of the palm branches, which is really kind of interesting and weird, like why palm branches? Um, there's this uh, idea of miraculous signs. Um, and also uh, that prophecies are fulfilled. So there's three things, palm branches, miraculous signs, prophecies are fulfilled. So first of all, the palm branches. Like, so I read this, so I was like, what's up with the palm branches? I did a little research. Um, and palm branches were basically a symbol of um, sort of like political, it was a political symbol, but of, of like military might and victory. And I kind of got thinking about that. I was like, like why a palm branch? It's not, I mean, if you're going to create a symbol for your country, um, that people would look to to feel like nationalistic pride and, and just remember that, like, what we're all about. Why would you pick like part of a tree? Like, that doesn't make any sense. And then I was like, wait a second. <laughs> wait a second. Canada has a symbol that looks that's part of a tree, that that's like part of our national symbol. And, I, and so I'm thinking about this, but this is and I had to ask, I mean, I, I had no idea, I did a little research too, but does anyone know why we have a maple leaf on our flag? Does anyone know why? No, nobody knows why. <laughs> Unless you do like remember grade four social class, nobody remembers why. Um, but uh, it, was, it was interesting, this was really funny. So apparently a be the beaver was actually the front runner for a really long time. It was gonna be a beaver. But then somebody somewhere along the line was like, oh, that's too hard to draw. We should just go with the maple leaf. <laughs> like seriously. I mean, it's kind of true. If you're going to draw something or like put a little symbol on your backpack or whatever, um, yeah, maple leaf is easier to draw. But, it's, but yeah, so it's on our flag. It's on our money. Everywhere you look in Canada, you see the maple leaf, right? And, uh, and some of you, <laughs> uh, maybe when you're in high school and you're on a trip somewhere and in a little act of rebellion that your parents didn't know about, you got a little tattoo on your calf, maybe, some of you. I almost did. I didn't. I, didn't have, I actually couldn't afford it. Otherwise, I would have done it. Um, <laughs> But so it's the same idea with the palm. Maple trees grow everywhere, mostly in Eastern Canada. Palm, palm trees grew everywhere around Jerusalem. And so it kind of became this symbol for them. And there's a story, uh, some, some scholars think that actually there's this battle that was really, really part of the Jews coming out of slavery in Egypt. The first big battle they had was in the city called Jericho and it was called the City of Palms. And so the palm was this, this remembrance of that was the first battle that we fought that God was with us. Um, actually, archeologists have found uh, what they believe are coins from the first century that the Jews who were fighting in rebellion against the Roman Empire. Um, this was like these coins that they created and they actually had the, the stamp of a palm on them. And so it's this powerful image for them. Um, and so them waving palm branches as Jesus is coming is actually like, it, it's, a, it's an explosive political symbol um, of, of who they thought Jesus was and what they thought was taking place. Um, so that like a little bit of history lesson, but I just want you to remember that, that the next time you see uh, the, the Canada flag and that glorious maple leaf, just remember, um, it was easier to draw than a beaver. <laughs> uh, I was a little worried I'm going to tell that joke and that's going to be like the only thing that people remember what I said this morning, but hopefully we'll get, we'll get a little deeper than that. Um, so yeah, so it's, 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 it's a meaningful symbol. The next thing I want to talk about is this, this idea of miraculous signs. So in verse 17, it says this, the crowd that was with him when he had called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead, continued to spread the word. And many people, because they had heard he had performed this sign, talking about raising Lazarus from the dead, they heard he'd performed this sign, they went out to meet him. So there's four, there's four books in the Bible, the Gospels, that are all different accounts of Jesus and who he was and what he did. They kind of give different perspectives. Three of them, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they talk about these miraculous things that Jesus did. He raised people from the dead. He uh, opened the eyes of people who were blind. He walked on water. He, he multiplied food for people. He cast out demons, all these miraculous things. And they call them miracles. But when you read the book of John, interestingly, he never calls them that. He never uses the word miracle. He always uses the word sign. So why are the miraculous things that Jesus does, why are they a sign? 
And one of the big purposes, of the reason why John wrote his book was uh, so that other people who were Jews like him would understand that Jesus was this person um, that he said he was. He was the Messiah. All of the things he do are signs that point to a greater spiritual reality of who he is. And I think it's really, really, really interesting that John phrases things in this way because, because I really believe, if you read through the Bible, God is always giving people signs. A sign is a symbol. It's something that points you to something that's a greater reality. When you see a stop sign, um, immediately you know exactly what that symbol, what that sign represents. And Jesus is saying, or and John, John is saying that every miracle, every supernatural thing that Jesus did is a sign that points to something greater. <clears throat> and when he, when he actually gets to the end of his book in chapter 20, he says uh, this, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But I wrote these ones so that you would believe that Jesus is the Messiah, that he's the son of God, and that by believing you would have life in his name. And so that's why the people want to make him king, because they see these signs and they're starting to interpret them and believe Jesus is this person we've been waiting for. He's the king. Um, I think it tells us also something really, really important, really actually incredible about who God is. That he's a God who sends his son Jesus into the world and he wants, us, he wants to give us signs so that we know who he is and what he's like. Has anyone ever prayed the prayer, <laughs> ever prayed the prayer, God, just give me a sign? Do you know what I mean? Like you're, you're trying to make a decision uh, or sometimes it's kind of like a, a foolish, hasty way. Like, oh, if I don't get a speeding ticket today, then I know it was okay that I woke up late. <laughs> That's a sign. <laughs> um, or God, if I just won the lottery, then I would know, you know, whatever, like that, you know, you're with me. Like those, those are the kind of signs I'm talking about. Um, but God does give us signs all the time in our lives. And the reason he gives us signs is so that we'll believe. Um, so that we'll believe and know who he is. I want to tell you guys a story about uh, a miraculous sign. And I actually have a video. Do you guys want to see a video of a miraculous sign? Um, about uh, probably about nine months ago, and this was in December. I'd, so I was, previously was working in another church called Westlife. I had quit there in November. Uh, around December, I was unemployed. I hadn't, things weren't really finalized here at Capstone. I really didn't know like, where my job was going to be. And uh, I was in this place of kind of uncertainty and wandering. And, and in the midst of that, God started speaking to me and he said, I want you to sell your house. Um, and that kind of made sense to me. I felt like we needed to probably need to downsize and I don't have a job and we can't just live here forever in this house that we probably can't afford. So get something smaller and transition to, to whatever. And so I started listening and praying and God started speaking to us and kind of giving us all these little hints and ideas of what... Um, where we needed to go. And so in January, we actually listed our house for sale. And, and on the very first weekend, in a terrible market, housing market, uh, on our first weekend, we had three offers in our house sold. And, uh, and I was like, okay, God, this is, uh, I think this is a sign um, that, he, that, you're, that you're leading us and showing us the direction you want us to go. And so the, the sale was finalized at the end of January, and then uh, we were turning the house over at the end of, or beginning of March. So we had about like a little over a month to find a new place to live. And there's a lot of things you can do when you're in a place like that. Um, my natural reaction was like, I got to get on red faster and I got to start like, <laughs> like printing, like, you know, going to look at all these houses, figuring out like what works for our family and what, what can we afford and all this stuff. Um, but I really, I, in a very unusual way that was kind of unlike me, I felt God really impressed in my heart. I actually just want you to wait. Um, and I want you to pray and I want you to trust me. I want you to get other people together and pray for you. Um, and believe that I'm going to provide something for you. Um, he started speaking to me. There's a story in the Bible about Jesus. Um, uh, actually happens later at the Passover. When Jesus was going to go into Jerusalem, he told his disciples, I want you to go into the city. Um, you're going to see a guy carrying a bucket of water. Follow him. He's going to show you a room that's prepared and waiting for us to have this meal together. I don't know if you remember that story. But God was saying, he, he pointed me to that passage and he said, I have a place that I prepared for you that I'm, that I'm holding, I'm keeping. Um, and so just, just believing, okay, God, I believe that there's a house that's prepared. So we started going around. We did look at some places. Uh, we couldn't really, I, Sarah was getting really anxious. She, actually, Sarah was like eight months pregnant at the time. Um, and I felt like I'm like causing so much stress to my wife, like I'm being a bad husband. Um, and so we're in this journey. And then we, we uh, there's a couple things. We, we met this, this, we went to look at this house and we felt like it was kind of, we, we could make this work. It works with our budget. It probably works with our family. And, but we weren't, just, we weren't really sure. Um, 
And I was in a class at Amber's at the time. I was driving home from the class, and I, this is so vivid in my mind, I remember it. I was driving home on Old Banff Coach Road, and I look up, and up ahead of me, there's this like massive flock of birds. Um, they're really small, kind of like the size of a sparrow, and they're just like darting kind of back and forth in this big cluster back where they're going to go towards one tree and pull away and go towards another tree and pull away. And I'm looking at these birds. I'm in the middle of this season of not knowing where I'm going to live, and I'm like, God, this is my family, like these birds. <laughs> like we go over here. No, it's not that place. We go over here. It's not that place. I'm like, God, just give us a place to land. Show us where we're supposed to land. And so a couple of weeks later, we went back to the second house. We felt like God was kind of drawing us towards it. And um, uh, it was interesting because the landlords had said they had had the house for, listed for a little while. And they said, you know what? We've been showing this house for a little while. And we feel like you guys are the first family that we could see living in it. We feel like we've been saving it for you. I was like, well, that's interesting. Um, and so we went back to look at it a second time. We we're walking around the house, Sarah and I, and it's been, God, is this, just give us a sense of peace. Is this where you want us to go? And then we walk kind of down the stairs uh, towards the back door. Sarah opens the back door and she looks out. Um, <laughs> and this is what she saw. Let's take a look at the screen. I kind of came around behind her and, and looked out the window too. It was the exact same flock of birds that I'd seen two weeks before. And we look at the back door, there's just like hundreds of them. And then they, this moment here, this is really cool. Just this massive amount of them. And then they all start landing in the tree in the backyard at this house. That for, for us was one of three miraculous signs that God gave us and said, this is where I want you to live. This is the place that I've prepared for you. Um, God still gives signs today. It's part of who he is. And it's, it's interesting because I believe he gave us this sign. This, this whole journey for us was just like an exercise of trusting. Like, are we going to trust God? Or are we going to like forge ahead and, and make the decision so that we can have peace and, and you know, if God, you know, wants something, well, well we need to, you know, make the decision. Um, but the Bible's filled with all these signs that point us to a true understanding of who Jesus is so that we can know him and believe him. Um, the greatest sign that we have is Jesus. Jesus is a sign from God um, that he came in the flesh, became a human, he dwelled among us so that we could know him, so we could know God, so we could understand what he's actually like. And the Bible is filled with signs um, of who God is, pointing us to true understanding of Jesus so that we can know him and believe in him. And after Jesus died, he rose and he ascended to heaven. He poured out his spirit on the church. And what he told his church was, I want you to go and do the things that I have done. And my spirit is going to give you power so that you can do the same things I can do. The, the gospel of Mark actually ends with the story that the message of the gospel will be accompanied by miraculous signs. And so Jesus actually said that we would do the things he would do. And there's this always intense coupling between miraculous signs and belief. And one doesn't, happen, one doesn't have to happen before the other. Um, you know, oftentimes when Jesus healed people, um, it was because he could see that they believed. And afterwards, he would tell them, it was because of your faith. It's because you believed that you were healed. Um, other times, like in the raising of Lazarus, it says Jesus did this sign, and then other people heard about it, and they believed because of the sign. And so it doesn't necessarily have to be one before the other, but the two are deeply, deeply connected. And uh, um, I felt like, you know, I was, I was praying with Sarah for you guys this week about just what to share, and, and Sarah really felt this message, and I felt it affirmed too, is how do you guys feel about that? How do you feel about God doing miraculous signs in your life? How do you feel about, about him doing that in the lives of the people that you know, in your friend's life, in your dad's life, in your sister's life? Do you feel like, do you feel like that's something you can ask God for? And if not, why not? Don't, don't, don't make it something ridiculous like, oh, like the whole like lottery thing. <laughs> um, I think God honors uh, above all humility and dependence on him. Like when Sarah and I were in the middle of this journey, like I really wanted to make the decision without him. It was really, really hard for me to like lay that down and say, God, I'm going to trust you. Um, and actually the Bible says uh, that God opposes people who are proud, but he gives grace to people who are humble. Um, the Pharisees they probably saw hundreds of signs that Jesus did, but they still didn't believe. Don't assume that God's going to get, just because God gives you a sign in your life that you will believe. First, check your heart and say, um, am I humble? Am I seeking? 
Um, and then be open to the signs that God is going to give and ask him, because he does. Yeah, I think that's all I want to say about miraculous signs. Uh, the, the next thing is uh, what I call like fulfillment of prophecy or Old Testament prophecy. Sometimes when you're reading, especially the Gospels, um, and you see it in Paul's writing too, that um, there's this little phrase, as it is written, which we saw in this one. That's kind of like code. That's like Bible code for somebody already wrote that this was going to happen. Um, and so, so John says that. He's talking about uh, when people are waving the palm branches, they're saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Those are references to Psalm 118. But then he says, as it is written, um, and he makes this reference to a part. It's actually a, a book of Zach called Zechariah in the Old Testament. So Zechariah was a prophet, a prophet. I think we've, we talk about this. A prophet is a person who, um, who senses God's heart and gets messages from God and then gives them to God's people so that they'll know what God wants to do. And so John is actually giving a direct reference to Zechariah chapter 9, which is a passage about a Messiah. It's about a person who's like a kingly figure that's going to come and, and deliver God's people. And I want us to read just, just the verse that John quoted, but also the verse that, that comes right after, because I think it's really important for seeing who Jesus is and the type of Messiah that he is. Um, and when you see, you see, you'll see it in your Bible, it's kind of blocked out there in verse 15. So it says this, um, I'm reading from the Zechariah part. It says, See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, on a full of a donkey. The next verse in Zechariah says this, I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem. The battle bow will be broken and he will proclaim uh, peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea. So this crowd, they see Jesus as their political savior. That's why they're waving palm branches. That's why they're quoting these other Psalms. But Jesus makes this decision to jump on a donkey and ride a donkey into town. Um, when he does that, he's actually intentionally doing two things, not just one thing. You think he's, he's fulfilling this prophecy in Zechariah. He's actually doing two things. One, yes, he's saying, by getting on the donkey, he's saying, uh, I am the Messiah, the king that you're looking for. I'm the person that you're waiting for. The crowd thinks it's him, and he's saying, yes, it's me. But the symbol of choosing a donkey, whenever a king would ride into town, a victorious king or a king who was going to usher in a new era, he would always ride a war horse. He'd be clothed in battle. He'd have his army with him, his, his generals and sergeants, and he would ride in as a symbol of power and military might. But Jesus doesn't do that. He gets on a donkey. Um, and, and he's the king, Zechariah says, who's going to usher in this era of peace, but he's not going to do it by starting a war. So Jesus is saying, yes, I am the king, but I'm not a king like the king you thought I would be. I'm a king who's humble. I'm a king who's gentle. Uh, I'm a king who's not going to uh, bust through and start a war like you think I should. And so we've got all these things these different things. I want to kind of pull things together and we're going to end just looking at this, the last section of, the, of, um, of this passage, which I sort of saw as Jesus' cam campaign <laughs> uh, model or his campaign speech. Uh, but we've got these things, the palms, we've got the miraculous signs, the fulfilling of prophecy. They're all coming together into this explosive um, political rally, like a spontaneous political rally. And immediately what you see is these groups start saying, this guy, Jesus, we want, to, we want to hear from him. We want to talk to him. This group of Greeks, they go and talk to his disciples. They're like, can we meet with Jesus? Um, so this is Jesus' glorious opportunity to lay out his campaign, to like make his you know, promises of this is what I'm going to do. These are the things I'm going to change. This is the way I'm going to fix it. Um, this is his golden opportunity. And this is what he says. He says, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves their life loses it. Whoever hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, they must follow me. That's it. No comprehensive plan. No new pipelines. <laughs> um, no tax breaks for the middle class. He says, I'm going to die and I'll be buried so that new things will grow. And he says, you, if you love your life, you're going to lose it. But if you reject a worldly life, you're going to receive an eternal one. 
This is what Jesus' plan is, and he lived it out through his whole ministry. He says, I'm going to come as a king, but I'm going to come in humility, on a donkey, not a warhouse. He says, I'm going to give you signs that prove who I am, but if you want to receive them, you have to believe in miracles like a child. I'm going to call people to join me, but I'm going to serve them instead of demanding to be served. I'm going to take down an enemy, but it's not the enemy that you think I'm going after. Ravi Zacharias says this, this thing. He says, I love it. He says, uh, people always want to address the evil that's in the world. But before we can do that, we need to address the evil that is within. Jesus says, I'm not going to go after the Romans. I'm going to go after sin, the thing that's within us. Uh, that tears apart our lives, that tears apart relationships, that breaks down societies, that separates us from God, Jesus says, that is my enemy. That is what I'm going to destroy. And he does it by dying on a cross in our place, by taking the weight of the punishment that we deserve upon himself. By the, 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 the we who, who turn away from God, who behave like rebels, who say, God, I don't, I don't think you should be king of my life. I should be the king of my life. In the Roman Empire, the, the punishment for treason to turn against Caesar was to be crucified. Jesus, in his act, his, his great saving act, goes to the cross and says, I will die the death that the rebels deserve. I will bear separation from God. I will pay the punishment. And to accomplish all this, he's buried in the ground like a grain of wheat. This idea of a grain that falls in the ground is buried, and it seems like it's gone, but then it begins to grow and it begins to spread, and there's this harvest. It's amazing, a beautiful picture. And, his, and this is his invitation. If you want to be a part of my kingdom, then you need to follow my example. And you need to learn to die yourself. Um, you need to let go of the life that you think you want and receive the life that I want to give you. And so some of us, I think we like the idea, as I kind of, kind of conclude and pull things together, we like the idea of what Jesus can do for us. It's kind of like... <laughs> Like, I, I like what maybe Andrew Shear can do. I like what Justin can do. I'll, I'll vote for him, and then we'll see what happens. Uh, Jesus isn't the kind of leader that you vote for and then see what happens. Um, that's not how God's kingdom works, and it's not until you let go and stop um, making yourself the king of your life and to learn to let that die and learn to even like, hate the selfish things within you that want to make your life all about you that you actually can receive um, and begin to walk into this new kingdom, this new era that Jesus has ushered in, uh, where there's abundance of life, there's fullness, there's healing for our souls and for our bodies, there's uh, res restoration of relationships, there's um, ending of poverty and slavery and, and all these things that sin and brokenness has caused, and Jesus wants to bring about a new kingdom. But he says if you want to be a part of that kingdom, you have to give up your life like I did. Jesus isn't the king that people wanted, but he was the king that they needed. He was the king who laid down his life for his subjects, humbling himself even to death on a cross so that we could live. So how do we respond to all this? I'm going to invite the worship team to come up, and we're going to close with a bit of time to reflect. And I want to come back to this question that I asked at the beginning is, um, how do you welcome a king? Um, Jesus isn't running for political office. <laughs> like I said, he's not someone that you can just vote for and then step back and see what happens. Um, he's a king who went to battle for you and for me, and it cost him his life. And now he's asking for the same from us. He said, if you want to be, if you want to follow me, uh, if you want to serve me, you need to follow me. And so maybe this morning, that's you. Um, and maybe he's asking for... Um, the same from you. And it says, I want this, this idea of the crowd, they were saying, Hosanna, save us. Maybe that's you this morning. You're saying like things are a mess around you uh, and you're saying, God, save us. But, but like the crowd, you don't even really know what you need to be saved from. Jesus knows. And he's a God who saves. He's a king who saves. And so... This morning, we're going to take a minute and just ask this question. I'm going to lead us in sort of a creative, I think, <laughs> um, exercise. I had a different way I was planning to conclude, and I felt God gave me this this morning to, to lead us in, so we're going to do that. Um, but the question is this, what part of my life do I need to welcome Jesus as king? Knowing that he's a king who has laid down his life for me, um, he's a king who saves, 
He doesn't just have a nice plan. Uh, he wants to give me a new life. What part of my life do I need to welcome him as king? And so this is what I want you to do. I'm going to pray. And I'm just going to invite you to close your eyes. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, I invite you your presence to come and to fill this place. And Holy Spirit, the thing that you do best is reveal Jesus. So I want to invite you to come and do what you do best. Come and reveal Jesus to us. And Jesus, by the power of your name, I block and, and tear down any at attempt of the enemy to distract us, um, to distort the things that you want to show us. I pray that the pictures in our mind would be vivid and clear in Jesus' name. Thank you, Holy Spirit. And we acknowledge that you're here. So this is what I want you to do. I want you to imagine your life as a city. It's kind of an abstract thought, but imagine your life, just picture in your mind a city. There's a wall around it, and there's one gate. There's only one way in and out, and you decide who comes in and who comes out. This city represents your life. In this city, just keep it in your mind, there's different buildings. There's a library and that represents your mind, the things that you think about, the things that you ponder, your creativity, your study. There's an office or a job site that represents the place that you work. There's a bank that represents your finances. There's a house with a yard that represents your family. And now imagine that Jesus has come to the gate of the city. He hasn't come in power on a war horse. He's come humble on a donkey. He's not going to force his way in. He's humble and he's ready to save. When you see him, ask him this question. Jesus, where do I need to welcome you today as king? Which building do I need to turn over to you? Just take a minute, 20 seconds, and ask him that. So you might have got something that I named. Maybe you got something different. Maybe you got something more specific. Just go with what you had. If you don't immediately know what that building or that place represents, if you're not sure, ask Jesus this question. Say, Jesus, what does that building or place represent to me? Just ask him and trust that he'll tell you. And now I want you to imagine standing at that place in front of that building, or maybe you're at the gate to the city. Maybe Jesus is saying, I want the whole thing. Imagine yourself unlocking the door, placing the keys in Jesus's hand and say, this belongs to you. I welcome you as king. Jesus, thank you that you are the example for us of what it means to surrender. That you're the king who, did, who didn't come to start a war, to demand uh, obedience. You're the came, king who came to serve, to give up your life. And we thank you. We honor you. We love you. Amen. Uh, if you're in a place where you're just feeling like God is showing you something new, I just want to encourage you to stay in that place. Ask God if there's anything else that he wants to, you to turn over to him or anything else he wants to say to you about 
the way that he wants to run or manage that part of your life. Um, but we're also going to continue to respond in worship. We're going to continue to welcome the king and praise the king uh, in this place. And one of the ways we're going to do that is through communion. We're going to remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. Um, that he was the king who chose to die so that we could be free. Uh, we're going to give our finances because uh, Jesus, who was rich, and had, who had every blessing in heaven, chose to become poor so that we could have the blessings uh, that we, um, so that we could be blessed and have uh, a relationship with God and everything that he wants to bring into our lives. Uh, we're going to sing and we're just going to declare how much we love Jesus, that we praise him uh, along with all of the rest of creation that he created to, uh, to give glory and bring, bring about his new kingdom. We're going to praise him. Um, and so we're going to sing this first song. I just invite you to sing along. Um, worship Jesus. Uh, and then we're going to take communion together. So as you get the bread and the cup, if you've made that decision to give Jesus your life and follow him, take the bread and cup. And if, if you haven't yet, that's okay. Uh, just let it pass by. No one's going to think any less of you. Uh, but hang on to it. And after this first song, we're going to take part together. Let's sing.